Trees are an amazing living creature that provide us with food, shelter, warmth, and the very air that we breathe. Come and join us for a discussion about It's All About the Trees on the way. Welcome to The Way with Leslie King and Scott Grimmett. this amazing thing that God created. Right. And, you know, as we began to think about this show, it's all about the trees, yeah. I began to think about a conversation I would have with somebody in biblical times. Right. And, um, you know, what started running through my mind is there's like very little that this individual and I could really share with experiences. You know, they don't have cell phones. Uh, no fast food, no Chipotle. Right. Um, you know, so here I am with this modern day living thing going on and all the modern technology. And this individual has a very different lifestyle, yeah. you know. And what occurred to me as I started to think about this topic was how God created trees. And no matter if you're somebody in the fourth century BC, first century, the Renaissance, um, 1800s, we've all watched our kids play on trees. I know, it's a fascinating topic. Yeah. Uh, and who, who, reading their Bible, has not wondered what the trees of Mamre looked like? You know, the things that Abraham it, it made a point, the Bible made a point of saying that he, he pitched his tents near the trees of Mamre. There you and, go. And it lights up my imagination every time. It's like, ooh, I would love to have seen that tree. Absolutely. And believe, believe it or not, there's actually a tree over there that they say may be that tree. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's just like this ancient... Yeah, you know, gnarly cool. looking stump. Yeah, but uh, it probably isn't. But still, it's it, it draws the imagination. It's something we can Absolutely. relate to. Absolutely. Well, it's you know, I'm sure that this biblical man or ancient person sat underneath a tree in the shade with his wife having lunch. That's right. Or we can all kind of relate to this idea that trees have remained the same and served mankind in very similar ways. They provide warmth. That's right. Food, shelter. There's this universal experience that God the Father baked into creation so that we would be able to share an experience with the early man, as Sorry. well as the modern man, and as well as the millennial man when he comes, because there'll be trees at that point too, I believe. That's so. right, and this, this point is not lost on the enemy either. Uh, okay. Because you, All right. we're not talking about tree hugging here. We're not. We're not <laughs> yeah, talking about yeah, loving yeah. earth worship. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 I'm not talking about a tree has a spirit by any yeah, means. Well, no. no. It, but you get the point, though. Yeah. The, I do. the enemy Absolutely. makes good use of this. It, the the profundity that we're discussing here has such deep reaching roots. Yeah. That. No uh, pun intended. No pun intended. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> such deep reaching roots that it actually even permeates into the into the uh, pagan world, into the paganistic society. Even yeah. Many of your pagan okay. systems actually had a great tree at its center. Right. Uh, I forget what their names are now, but uh, Norse mythology, especially, right. had, had, had this great tree that gave off wisdom of all things. Yeah. Um, it it it, it uh, certainly is familiar to what we, a Christian would know. So I think this really leans in to this whole idea that God created trees that we all can relate to, yes. whether whether we're a godly man or whether we're a pagan man, or no matter who we are, we can all stand throughout time together and share life experiences that we've had with trees. And the interesting part is we see God use trees in the Bible in a very real sense, right? Literal, right, And literal. then very symbolically Definitely. to represent us in our life, and then even to a certain degree what some of our relationship is going to be like as we go forward. Because, see, we have we're, – we're going to look at this. So we've got a two-episode approach to this. We're going to look at some real trees, and we're going to start in the garden, the tree right. of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. So they're going to serve as our bookends, right. uh, and they're real. They're real. And we're going to kind of address those. And then there's a whole lot of references throughout the scriptures that talk about different types of trees and how we're to be like them. And so I think as we move along, we're going to spend time examining the way trees are represented in the Bible, what they mean, how they should influence our walk, right. and really kind of what God is putting there for us to realize 
how trees really represent a very important part of his creation, and it will then be when we get to paradise even. That's so right. it's, it's an empirically shared experience. Absolutely. So our first tree is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And so just setting the stage here, God had just created Adam and Eve, all the mm-hmm. animals, everything, and he sits back and he goes, hmm, this is rocking. Right. This is good. I like this. And then he starts to allow Adam to name animals, starts to kind of put him in his role as an image bearer. Right. And so then all of a sudden, out of the blue, very strange, but I think very purposeful, God the Father steps up and says, hmm, all right, you're doing good. You worked hard. You're in my image. One thing. You can have everything, he says. Right. Everything. But one thing, and it's the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and don't eat from it. And so we have this very interesting test, because he could have not said anything, right? Or he could have like put it like not in the middle. <laughs> or could, not in the garden. Or not in the garden at all, right? right? So there's something happening here, and I think that there's a lot we can get out of it. And the first thing that pops into my mind is wow, we've got a coming of age of Adam and and Eve. We've got a test. God has baked in the tree to be a part of our coming to age, if you will, as mankind to some degree here. And it speaks to our natural propensity toward ingratitude and thanklessness. Uh, Yeah. It does, Mm -hmm. because... The garden. This was this was no little uh, rose garden. This was this was no little potato garden in the back in, in the back lot. Right, right. The the Garden of Eden was the size of a small continent. It was it was country gargantuan. Size. So they literally had yeah. every other tree in the world at had that everything. time. They had it all. Had it God all. had given them all. So whatever came out of trees, I'm sure whatever sprouted out of ground, God had given them everything that every, they needed, yeah. and except for these two trees. Right. And so what we have to, the lesson we have to take away from that is the fact that we have to be on our guard, not just against that snake that's going to come slithering in to help tempt us. Right, right, right. We have to be on guard against our own wicked, evil hearts. That's right. First and foremost. And I think that's what Satan's still doing to this day. He's roaming around, and he's not making it all happen, but he's watching to see what our weaknesses are and leveraging those. And he actually has experience with some of that as well, and we're going right. to talk about that in just a few minutes. But I think this is a coming of age. This is the test of being image bearers. We were created in God's image, and a part of that is that free moral agent, the free will that he put in us. Right. Uh, Adam and Eve were under his tutelage. He was naming animals. They're hanging out. They're having fun. They're walking in the garden. They're hanging out underneath trees. With God Almighty. With God Almighty. They have it all. And then all of a sudden, God's like, okay, it's time to kind of see, can can you bear the image of a mature godly man and woman? And the test didn't go so well, I think, as we realized, right? Right, it did not. So they failed the test, right? Um, Satan comes in, and he um, doesn't make them, but he hoodwinks them big right. time, you know? And so it's really interesting, because in Isaiah fourteen fourteen, Isaiah talks about how um, Satan actually wanted to be like God and actually got prideful, got arrogant, and wanted to start to elevate his place and he realizes that, hmm, I can kind of see here, well, maybe I can try to trick these guys, right? All right. So he goes to Adam and Eve, and you can see in, in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 5, that he tells them, when you eat from the tree that God didn't really tell you not to eat from, we all know he did because it was pretty <laughs> literal, <laughs> Yeah. That, he's, um, that Satan goes, well, when you eat it, you're going to be like him. So automatically, there's that first temptation. Right. You know there what I mean? There was a grain of truth in it. That's what he always does to truth. Yep. He takes truth. And he twists it. He does. The, gar- the, the tree of the gar- knowledge of good and evil was indeed just that. Right. He was telling them the truth about that. But what he was te- what he was leaving out very conveniently was okay. the fact that the only way, the only access to that was through the obedience to God. That's right. It was, it was only through permission. One day okay. we don't we don't know how that would have turned out otherwise. But one day right. the Lord was going to allow them to have that fruit. Absolutely. They just had to wait and do it God's way. Absolutely. So so the devil does what he always does. He twists. He takes just enough truth to make it palatable, make it palpable, and then he twists it up, and right. he makes he makes the truth a worse lie than what a, what a direct lie would have been. Right, absolutely. God wants us to have everything, but in the right timing. Right. And God was checking out to see where Adam and Eve were. It was a coming of age of mankind. It was a, will you trust me? Right. Will you love me? Will you understand that I am God taking care of you? 
And they started questioning that because Satan did what? He goes, oh, God doesn't want you to be like him right? because he's telling you not to eat from the tree. And we both know that God wants us to be like him because we're his children. But God, did God really say? that's? We get that yeah, nonsense yeah. to this day. Yeah, yeah. Every time you get a promise, the Lord will invariably wait a couple of years or at least a, a year or two before he delivers on that promise. We have... Yeah, he did we, to we, Abraham. We reenact this every day in our lives. Yeah, God, absolutely. Every time God comes... I believe in words of knowledge and all the other gifts of the spiritual, natural, supernatural. Yeah, but absolutely. Every time someone gets a really good word of knowledge, great promotion's coming. You know, this or that's coming. Yeah, they think it's next week. Yeah, oh, you better believe <laughs> that it's going... You've got some time to wait. <laughs> right. Because the Lord is going to make sure that you yeah. are ready for that. And the first step in that is obedience. Absolutely. Waiting. One of the things, though, I think we should really pause to, to uh, take to take stock in is the fact okay. that uh, we need to stomp on the idea that this story is anything other than literal. This is a literal yeah. story. Absolutely. You know, the Bible is to be, be taken literally, every single syllable of it. Now, a lot of the Bible does have depths to which uh, we must dig yeah. down and find more okay. truths. Some, right. Much of the Bible has more than one truth in it and but the layers go down yeah sure it doesn't negate the truth to the top layer right so this story is very literal and we have a lot of people in academia uh who do yeoman's work pounding people in the head all the time that the bible was not to be taken literally yeah you know you start with nonsense yeah and they start with this this is this is the reason why it's important to talk about this the hinge pen right they start with the garden of eden oh come on man do you really think that people that two people sitting naked were listening to a snake talk to them Right, you know, right. and then went and then went and plunged the entire world into wickedness because they ate an apple. Yeah. I mean, th- yeah. they'll start with that, and before right. you know it, we've got some egg-headed Christians among us who like to think themselves more clever than they really are. And before you know it, yeah. they have thrown they have thrown in that gamut. They have thrown down the they have you know thrown down that truth in favor of some allegorical nonsense. No, right. this story is true. Right. The trees are real. The, trees are real. Absolutely, the, the garden. Is real, and all of those things exist to this very day. Absolutely, and that's what we have to realize. Uh, he didn't do away with the garden, right? No, he closed it off. He did because of the disobedience. Because Adam and Eve became prideful and said, "We're not going to trust God," and oh, well, we just want to be like God and be self-sufficient because that's what Satan did, right? Right. So he's echoing his own sinful desires, and. God knew that that would be the case. He wants us to move forward and to actually encounter the tree of knowledge on a daily basis, and we do symbolically, all right? So we're not grabbing the apple, but when we start to decide we're not going to trust God, when we start to be disobedient, we start to walk away from the image he originally created us in. Right. When we decide that we are too smart to take stories like this literally, we are reenacting that sin all over again. Absolutely. We are reaching for that knowledge, thinking that right. we're going to be more clever than God. Absolutely. No, you can't do that. Yeah, so for all you guys out there who are like thinking you're going to give Adam a little smackdown when you get to heaven. A heavens no. Um, you know what? You probably would not only have ate the apple, you would <laughs> ate a whole barrel of them. I know I would have. Apple and pie. so I think, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think I, this and I go, oh my gosh, man, at the tree of knowledge of good and evil I encounter each day. I've been disobedient before, uh, to my shame, but I'm not going to be pointing my finger in Adam's face when I get to heaven. Absolutely not. So, I he, mean, he lived for almost a thousand years, and I guarantee you, he lived a more righteous life than most of us would ever even dream of doing so right. after he repented. And that'd be tough to live that long yeah. knowing that you were disobedient. Yeah, and the, the entire world loving. hated his guts because of it. And yeah. to this day, we blame Adam and Eve. To this yeah. day, every time something goes wrong... I know, that's the funny like, part of it. It's like, to this day, it's like, oh, stinking right. Adam and Eve. You're right, it, right. It, well, it's definitely my go-to when I want my, my, you know, my wife to be kind of... When I want her to listen to me as her <laughs> husband, and you know, and I'm kind of like, well, how did the apple the thing go? Right, absolutely. So, all right, well, so it all starts out with a tree, a real tree in the garden. All didn't right. go well. No. Test was failed, but God knew it. It could have gone either way, but he knew, he knew what was going to kind of take place. So time goes along here. And so Satan and even mankind um, are moving along and they're thinking that, you know, there's a different kind of God that's in place, that even God comes along with Israel and uh, brings them out of Egypt. That's all going pretty well. Um, Eventually, what we see 
is from a stump. So we're still talking about a tree, right. but now it's a stump, and the stump represents, in my mind, and I don't think literally, because I think we're going to cover that in a minute, or you will, this whole idea that um, just because we think that we can out move maneuver God, or we think we're going to take control of things, we're kind of chopping down the tree of blessing of knowledge and wisdom. And actually, it's it's kind of the tree of stupidity. Yeah. When I start to think I can outthink God and his tree... I well, know, and he's and saying so, something like, yeah, aren't you cute? Yeah, aren't you, right, absolutely. <laughs> so the scriptures go along, and we get to Isaiah chapter 11, verses uh, 1 and 2, and it talks about how God will bring forth out of a stump right. the root of Jesse, a branch that will bear fruit. And so here we see the restoration from the failed test back in the garden. I think there's a symbolic stump in my mind, and I think it's definitely there, and I think it has some really deep um, historical meaning uh, within the Israel nation. Well, it's another one of those, those examples where God used a tree mm-hmm. in, a different alleg- in a different allegorical sense to represent something else. Uh, we see this in the account of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar during his okay. testing. Yeah, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel had a vision, uh, right. and he saw a huge tree. Mm-hmm. And underneath the tree, every spreading, uh, all the uh, spreading limbs, every beast of the field, and everybody, all the nations right. had gathered under mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Okay, then Daniel went on to disclose that Nebuchadnezzar himself was that tree. Mm-hmm. His line was that tree, and the entire world was underneath his his protection and under okay. his reign. All right, all right. The, in that vision, it showed that tree getting cut down. That's right. Okay, it now did. the allegory that we're talking about though is Jesse's line. Jesse's line. So we're talking about the kingship of David here. We're talking about. Right. The kingship through which Messiah was pro- prophesied to come. This is no small thing, and of course he did. Right. But unfortunately, in the discourse of living out their lives as mm-hmm. two, one than two kingdoms, that's right. Uh, the wickedness of the Israelites lost for themselves that esteem, that that prestige, that di- that that disobedience in the nation. That's right. And because that that was the act that cut that stump down. Right. And the so, actual line of David that right. would but that would rule Israel. Forever. That's right. Well, it, it it did. It did. That's the mercy and grace of God. That's the yeah, beauty of... That's the stump. That's the stump. That's the right. The stump from which that great branch came. And of course, it's all over the world now. It's more powerful now than it ever was. It, man's wickedness, that's the cool thing about that allegory, and that is the fact that man's wickedness and all of its all of its uh, rotten glory yeah. was un, was not enough to thwart God's plan. That's right. God's plan still came. To, it was a little shoot that came out of that right. out of that stump, but that little yeah. shoot grew into a great tree, and that great tree covers the entire world now. Yeah, we always get very excited when we have a book devotional that accompanies a particular podcast series. And then in this instance, we have a devotional by the name of Walking in the Truth that accompanies our pod series, The Battle for the Truth. Never in modern times has the truth been under attack like what we are currently seeing. Vicious debates are raging over the sanctity of life, over sexuality, over gender identity, over the very existence of a loving God. Although Isaiah chapter five, verse 20, sternly warns against calling evil good and good evil, this seems to be the sad condition of our society these days. This devotional is dedicated to the only absolute truth that we have in this fallen world. The Holy Bible and the scriptures therein are given to us by a loving God to help us find our way home. The attack on the truth is simply the process of calling the goodness of God evil and the evil of Satan good, and it's a blatant attempt to try to bring down the goodness of God to be equal to man or even below Satan. Walking in the Truth devotional covers key scriptures ranging anywhere from the testimony of truth in Jesus to how the Holy Spirit is involved in our walk as Christians to lead us into truth. And then it comes to a close with the judgment of the truth from God, which is kind of a rather heavy chapter, but really brings it home to make sure folks understand that God is paying very close attention to how we accept the truth and how we apply it to our lives. Readers will also have a personal reflection and prayer section for every verse covered. To learn how you can purchase Walking in the Truth, come visit our bookstore on thetruthandthelife.com and thank you for taking your time to support the Truth and the Life broadcast.
The beauty of it is, is it's more like an orchard now, right? Because we're a part of that. And so here's what it says in in Isaiah 11 verse two, and it just says, "The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and the spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel." right? And the spirit of knowledge and the fear. So you see the connection back to the tree of knowledge of yeah. good and evil That's right. through the branch that comes out of the stump. Right. So, wow. It's a beautiful thing. God's an awesome God. And, and he uses his trees because we, we can share that experience. We know yeah. from, a, from a child, we know the basic you know, makeup of a tree. We know that a tree only does what it's supposed to do. We, only, we know that it's, it produces the kind of fruit that it's supposed to produce. And if it doesn't, yeah. It's there's nothing to really to do for it but to cut it down. That's absolutely true. And then we've all seen stumps. We know what that is. We know how that happens. Somebody cuts it down, or maybe eventually it dies on its own. Um, very interesting. So here we see the tree of knowledge of good and evil, failed test for mankind. Move forward, go through time, and God decides, hey, we've got a stump here that once again represents a tree of right. failed human effort. But I'm going to raise up my plan, my rescue plan for mankind through a stump, through Jesus, and now we're going to move into looking at some other types of trees. Oh as yeah, well. Well, what did you tell Paul? You know, my grace is sufficient for you. For in your weakness, I am. You know, he is shown strong. I'm paraphrasing. That's right. But it, he, his strength is revealed in our weaknesses. Absolutely. And, and that stump is a great example of it. It's a great example. And so, as we start to look at some other trees, we're going to look at an olive tree. Olive trees are represented in the the Bible in a lot of different ways. Right. Now, interesting thing about olive trees, little factoids here, um, they can live 300 to 600 years. In some cases, there are some that are 2,000 years old. That's right. And there are some of them still in Israel that go, date back to the time of Jesus, which is amazing. Right. And uh, the bark is resistant to decay. It's good for cooking, skin care. They're yummy. Um, spiritual purposes for those who like them. Yes, um, yes you don't like I them I hear much. they're good. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a fan, um, but I'm not hating on people who do like them. So. No, I, do, I dig olives. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, they also are good for medicinal teas. And they appear as a symbol of peace in like seven national flags, um, and about three or four different states in the United States have them as well. So olive trees represent some very meaningful things that as I think we go through this, we'll be able to see them kind of echoed. Right, and there's no coincidence that Jesus chose a grove of olive trees uh, to act out his final act before going to the cross. Absolutely. You know, the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane yeah. was in fact the place where people in Israel at that time would go okay, yeah. to have their olives pressed into oil. Ooh. In fact, they have, arch- yeah. they have found uh, the, the presses. They have found those. In those gardens, yeah. And, and the, they have actually found those things. And yeah. they have dated them back to that very time. And you know, Very there are some actually some trees there that they think may also date back to that time. Yeah, yeah, you definitely s- have heard that as well because uh, you, they. You can they, see them. You can, you can go yeah. on Google and look them up. That olive grove is still there. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think that keeping that in mind, the last hours that Jesus was on the earth right. and his last teachings and where he was arrested was in an olive grove right. where they actually crushed. And squeezed That's right. the oil, the spiritual oil, out of it. You can't make that up. You can't make that up. That's it, those it, things are not a the mistake represent, at all. The representation is too perfect. Absolutely. God planned this before the world was created. Absolutely, and I think we need to embrace that as we look at Psalms chapter five verses or chapter fifty-two verses eight and nine. It talks about a green olive tree. Now it's in the KJV. When you look at the NIV, it doesn't say green olive tree, but I think we need to distinguish here right. is that a green olive tree is actually someone who trusts in God, in his mercy. They praise his name openly, and they actually just really wait on him in a way. And so we really see here that if we want to be olive trees, green ones, right? Right. We need to be thinking about, do I trust in God's mercy? Do I hope in his name? And then do I praise him openly, meaning you're not cowering back and you're really making sure you're open about your faith, because praising him doesn't always mean singing, but praising him could be thanking him, could be sharing him, and doing all those kind of things. So here we see... Obedience. 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 Highest form of worship. Okay. I'll say it a thousand times, and I I believe that with all my heart. Absolutely. And the one thing you can't do is you can't hide anything from God. One of the great things about trees is, is their nature is very simple. And the fact is, is that God knows what's inside you, and what is inside you yeah. will eventually produce either good or bad. Yeah. One or the other. You know, and, and 
throughout the Bible, that is that illustration is used over and over again. Absolutely. Well, that, that moves us to Romans chapter 11, verses 19 through 20, and then in verse 24, it's Paul, he's talking to the Romans. And some Romans, sounds like they're getting a little bit cocky, right? <laughs> they're like, hey, we're, you know, we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit, we're brought in. And they're starting to get a little bit arrogant about the Jewish people or others who aren't believing. Right. And so the next tree we're going to look at, it's an olive tree, but it's the cultivated olive tree. And Paul talks about grafting it in. Paul's whole point in these scriptures is to represent the kindness and the sternness of God through the fact that he's once again a gardener. Of course, he was a gardener in the garden, right? Right. And he's a gardener who's raising up a branch out of the stump. Right. And so God is represented as this um, gardener all the time. And so this whole thing is Paul's getting at is that don't be so arrogant, because if he cut off natural branches out of the olive tree and then has taken you wild branches from a wild olive tree and grafted you in, that represents his kindness. But don't get too uppity. Because it, it can be reversed. It can be reversed. That was the point. That was the point. And this scripture right here is yet another one of those scriptures that should is a big slap in the face to the whole greasy grace narrative that people like to try to... Right. Well, not try to. They are doing with, with great success, unfortunately, throughout the body of Christ. Yeah. But this is one of those scriptures that says very clearly that you know, if you rest on your laurels and you fail to produce, right. the very same grafting process that puts you in there can, can cause your removal. Right. And it will be your fault. Yeah, not, I don't, I don't, I don't the, know how anyone can... The, the gardener doesn't want to do it or he wouldn't have grafted us in in the first place. Right. And Paul using the example, he's not using the example, don't be arrogant just because you know it's just a bad character thing. He's going, don't do it because it could cause a grafting out, that God will graft out or cut off those who aren't living the way he's supposed to, you know, or according to whatever. So I don't know at what point God comes along and cleaves you off, but the scriptures themselves concern me enough that I'm just going to be on my knees and And making sure I'm not arrogant. There you got it. What What did the Lord say throughout scripture is the beginning of wisdom? Fear of the Lord. The fear of God. That's right. Absolutely. What would have taken us to that tree? Right straight to that tree? <laughs> the fear of God. <laughs> the fear of God. That's right. What took them to that tree was a, a lack of it. A lack of fear. A lack of being too comfortable with what he had given them. And maybe they were just too comfortable with his love and his presence. And and that's a real thing. At the same time, they got really lax, thought it was all about themselves. I'm pretty sure Adam was thinking he's... Uh, He's got it going on. He just named every creature on the earth. That's right. So, well, but the same thing applies in Paul's time. He was basically speaking to a lack of fear, a right. lack of godly. If you fear God, yeah, and by that I mean awe, uh, you know, right. reverence, reverence, right? Yeah. It's not necessarily always the, the jittery, you know, right stuff. Yeah, it's we're talking about fearing and awing, godly reverence, godly reverence, knowing who you're dealing with. Knowing it, absolutely, yeah, and I think that's extremely that. important to be able to keep that in mind. Four thousand years later, it was this, it was the same thing. Yeah, absolutely, and I I think it's in the garden, it's throughout time, and I think we need to learn the lesson from the trees here. That's right. We should not get so comfortable that we don't have reverence for God, and then we begin to think that we are like God or that we are God, uh, no. and start to not wait on Him and trust His sovereignty. No. And these individuals in Rome. Um, Paul's putting a pretty stern warning out there to him. He said there is kindness, but there's sternness. The kindness and sternness of God. Mm-hmm. He actually that was the turn of phrase he used, and it's something we must never lose sight of. Right. Absolutely. I think that's really important. And, yeah. Oh, they're not easy scriptures to read because we don't want to think about getting grafted out, and I, and I don't ever want to get to the point where I'm thinking I'm never going to be grafted out, because um, I know His mercy will bring me in if I'm in humility and right. I'm in fear and trembling. Um, at the same time. I know that I can fall out of those graces in a way that if I really repent or I really reject or recant the faith or I start doing things that are so heinous. Right. God is real time. Mm -hmm. God is real time. And the fact is, is that there are examples in the Bible over and over again of people who were in good good graces with God, who one one verse was walking and even manifesting great miracles, and then later on in the story, you find out that they were destroyed because of their wickedness. Right. We There there are many lessons to learn from this, and what I would exhort people to do from the bottom of my heart is read your Bible, please. Yeah, yeah. Get it out. Don't take anybody's 
word for it. Right. You know, you may have a great preacher, you may have a great pastor. Great. I'm I'm glad for that. There are a lot of really talented people in pulpits right now. Absolutely. Unfortunately, wickedness is at an all-time high at the same time. So some mm-hmm. there's a disconnect here. Read right. your Bible, please, and understand what the text says for itself. From Paul to Peter to Jude, James, they all talk about this very same thing over and over again. There is no excuse for acting righteous and or, or acting like you're righteous, but actually living out a wicked, a wicked, wicked lifestyle. Yeah. You can't do it. Yeah. The, no. the good news is the fact that that, that stump, that stump produced, that yes, stump it produced. Did. The King of Glory reigns. Yep. He's coming again, and you know, so his his promises are true, and they will come to pass, just like he said. Absolutely. That stump created that orchard that we're a part of, that we should be able to live out you know, our faith and our walk, not only as the green olive tree, right. but as the olive tree that's been grafted in, but we need to remain in humility. That's right. Others aren't better than us or worse than us, and we're not better than them because of God's kindness. No. And too often, I think we as Christians, we begin to think, well, because God loves me, I'm in better favor. No, he died for everyone the same as he did for me, and I have to remember that. That's right. All right, we're going to be kind of wrapping this up a little bit here with just uh, some highlights. Now, we're going to have uh, an episode two. We're going to cover a series of more trees, and then it'll wrap up with the tree of life. But let's keep in mind here that the tree of good and evil was a real tree, all right? Um, not some cute story, no. no matter who tells you that. Um, but even though there's a real tree in the garden, we encounter a symbolic tree of knowledge ongoing and every day, and we're tested with our obedience or not. And our fear. Um, and our fear. And I think it all starts there going, we do serve a God who has sternness as much as kindness. Right. And it's real important to think about that. If we fear nothing but God, we will have access to that tree. Absolutely. At some point, he wants us to have it all. Well, yeah. But not you, everything should well, be given it, to you, us all at once. You see it in our Christian walk. Yeah. Every, every single time somebody really gives their heart to God, they could be the, the biggest blithering idiot beforehand and have absolutely <laughs> no sense whatsoever. But yeah. you, I've seen it over and over in my life where suddenly they start reading their Bible and you and see cleverness starting to creep up. They you see some wisdom. Wisdom starts manifesting. Yeah. It's like So by obeying, by going to the tree the proper way, in the allegorical sense, yes. we get access to that, that tree. God is all giving. He's all good. Yeah, see, that's the beauty of it, right? So eating from the tree means we approach it in disobedience without the approval of God. There so you go. We're, we're branching out from the stump, and he's giving us the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but it means we need to be obedient to that. Disobedience means we're walking away from our original God-bearing purpose and communion with him. And everyone needs to realize that. So the next time you feel like you're going to do it yourself or do something contrary to the scriptures, keep in mind you're willfully choosing to do what Adam and Eve did and to walk away from a relationship and communion with God and your God-bearing purpose that you have in him. And so I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. Now, when we're disobedient, it, rem- it is removal of our purpose in God, and it always brings forth, but he always will bring forth that stump, if we're willing to get on our knees, if That's we're right. willing to be repentant. Yes, just be repentant. Absolutely. Just be soft in the hands of your God. Right. Be, when we be, make a mistake. That's right. Go. He will forgive you every single time if you go to him on your knees, if you go to him with true repentance. True repentance. He, he will never turn you away. It's important for us to try to be like the green olive tree we talked about. Right. And that takes effort. It means trusting in his mercy, which means... I'm trusting in you, God, that I can always come back to you when I make a mistake. That's right. Because like, you're in, and I trust in your name, your salvation, and who you are, and being able to keep that there, and then being able to be open about pray, open about being a Christ follower. That's right. Is what this openly praising Him means. That's right. You know, I know we're in a society where Christians are really being put through the gauntlet, but we should not hide who we are. Right. doesn't mean we need to be bashing other people. In fact, be careful, because if you claim to be a Christian, um, you could do some damage to the name of Christ because of the stupid things you might do. That's right. So we need to be careful of that. But, and so... You know, we see the examples, uh, like in great men like David. When he yeah. got caught, he, he, had just got, he had just been busted out for murder. Right. Uh, and, uh, for adultery and murder. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, one, two, bang, right in the same one. And his reaction to that was to fall on his face 
and repent. And if you read the psalm, that I think it's 51, it might, it might be something different, but it's the psalm where he actually, it's recorded what he actually said. Yeah. He was crying out, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. That's right. This is before Yeshua came in his flesh, and he, he valued the presence of God above all things. Great example. This is, this is, this is repentance. This Absolutely. is the beauty of repentance. Well, and he realized that, and he said, I've sinned against you, God. That's right. And here's the beautiful thing about God's reaction. After all that nastiness, after everything that he did, which would have been a death sentence for anybody else, I think, yeah. uh, God th- so thoroughly re- uh, forgave him that even in, in the book, in the Kings, when every single time after David left this earth, God referred to David as the, he's the one, he followed my rules, he followed my commands. He was a good and just king. God had nothing but praise left for him. He was a man after my heart, That's right. Said. That's right. That's how thorough God's forgiveness has always been, even yeah. before mm-hmm. atonement. Yeah. He, as, as far as east is from the west, that's how far our sins are from us. So go right. to him. He's good. That's He's right. waiting for you. Absolutely. And we need to remember that. So yes, there is sternness to think about, but that's a part of love. That's a part of being a parent. We all need to realize that sometimes for us to show love to our kids, we need to be stern about the rules and following them, or it might cost our children their lives or, right. or something very bad. Or worse. But the kindness is that restoration. The, fa- the kindness is he brings in everybody, wild and natural olive branches, that's right. and he cultivates them into a cultivated olive tree. That's right. And that's the beauty of the whole story where we're going to leave it now. And I think that we'll just we'll try to invite you guys to come back in our next episode. It's all about the trees part two. We would like to invite you to come visit us at thetruthandthelife.com. You can check out our bookstore. Maybe there's some other videos and teachings you'd like to get on there. We also have a gift store we'd like for you to visit because we'd like to encourage you to support the ministry so we can continue to broadcast and reach uh, all of our listeners and viewers as the show is syndicated. So uh, we do have a lot of folks um, that really want to be a part and we want to provide that. So thank you for joining us on the way. To learn more about the way, visit the truth and the life.com. Send me a sunset of tomorrow.